All righty, guys. We are really in store today. We are uh, we've we've got our first and this uh, first guest in this MOS, I should say. That's a bit of a tongue twister. Uh, we've got author and Marine Scout sniper, Mr. Ed Kugler. Um, he was with the Fourth Marine Division and was uh, picked up or. Uh, asked to volunteer for a uh, scout sniper program uh the i believe the first uh one in country and uh passed it became a scout sniper and started off his career or his uh first actually first few missions in vietnam with uh third force recon who we've had uh two guests on previously from third force so we are really honored uh today to have him and he's written a great book about his service called get the glare off dead center a marine sniper's two-year odyssey in the vietnam war and it is absolutely wonderful and as a matter of fact i almost finished it rereading it uh to get ready today but without further ado um i'm gonna hand it over to mr ed and let him give a little uh biography and we'll get started with questions and all of that today mr ed how are you today i'm doing good excellent excellent Great. Thanks for having me on. Um, it's always fun. I uh, grew up in a little town in Ohio called Lock 17. It had 75 people in it and uh, went to school a couple of miles away in a little school. We had 35 kids in my graduating class, but uh, I uh, was not a great student. I uh, spent uh, my junior year, I skipped 55 days of school, and my senior year, I my mom was upset, so I only skipped 35. But uh, but I went to the Marine Corps at Paris Islands uh, straight two weeks after high school, and uh, went there. That was pretty interesting, and um, and then I ended up in Santo Domingo um, about a, a year and a half after graduation from boot camp, and. Uh, that was my first combat down there. And then I, uh, uh, ended up volunteering to go to Nam and, uh, got there and was going to be a grunt replacement. And a, a couple of gunnies came through. We, I went over on ship. So we had, um, I don't know, I think 900 of us maybe on ship and we were all divided by companies and platoons and all that just simply for organization and the two gunnies came through and wanted to, uh, they were recruiting to start scout snipers again. And, um, uh, out of all those, there was only, um, about, I think it was 11 that volunteered and we were to be trained and were trained up at, uh, Fubai in country. And, um, and my whole rationale becoming a sniper was, uh, the little skirmish we got in down in Santa Domingo, I got wounded and, uh, and we were trying to take a 35 or a 30 caliber machine gun off of a radio station top. And, and so when uh, they were asking for snipers, my rationale, I was an expert on a rifle range. So my rationale was it's got to be better than charging machine guns. And uh, that's how I became a sniper. Then I really got into it, stayed two years and, and uh, came back, and here I am. You know, uh, to 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 first start off with that, uh, we'll, we'll kind of it's going to be Tarantino like. We'll be going back and forth a little bit. When okay. uh, after after Vietnam, when did you uh, sit down and and really decide to 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 put your experience to to paper uh, and write a book? It was about, um, well, we all, you know, the, I had a special team there called the Rogues, and that, that that actually went on. I was there two years, but uh, two other guys took it after that, so we spanned about three years. And I stayed in touch. I kept them all together, the ones that came home, and so we stayed in touch over the years. And it was probably, I got home in 68 and got married in 69 and then you know had a career and whatnot 
And uh, so it was into about the 80s when I began to realize, looking back, what a special experience that I had and with the guys I was with. And, and so I, start, I started trying to write it about um, late 80s. And I would get three or four. I remember one time I got five chapters done. I'd give it to my wife and she'd go, that's terrible. And uh, I'd start over. And one day she said to me, you know, you're a great storyteller. Tell the story. Quit trying to be a writer. Just tell it. And when I did that, I actually finished it in four months. <laughs> and uh, And the way that I did it was simply remembering events and then putting them together and calling my guys and, and kind of harmonizing things, you know, but it's, uh, so I just tried to tell it as if I was sitting there with you, you know, it, 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 it I can assume a lot uh, of the viewers, like I said, uh, offline, uh, I've gotten a lot of, <clears throat> a lot of great feedback that we were going to have you on and, and, and people, recognizing uh because i made a, a post about you this morning but uh it, it it's really one of the more uh personal books i mean again guys there's the cover and the, the it's linked down in amazon uh the amazon link is in the show notes um it it's really i, I don't know if you, you guys kept journals or not or, or if you were ex kept notes or or anything but your attention to detail uh, your your the fellow rogues, uh, not only the rogues, but also the the Force Recon gentlemen you hook up with, the the experiences with the Arvin. I mean, you really get all of that across so well. Uh, even uh, th there's great humor in there. There's also some some sad sad spots in there. Um, the, besides speaking to your to your uh, fellow rogues did you have any issues getting uh bringing up any of this stuff or what what between you and the rogues did y'all have it pretty nailed down on, on getting it all together well i had uh there were um there was a guy uh he tomo in the book but dan ireland he's passed away now from brain cancer but but he uh he was my right hand man for a while and he he kept copious notes. I did also, you know, I had a, I had a book of coordinates of all the kills and all the encounters and everything. So I did have the benefit of that. And then the guy that, that uh, called him Haas in the book, but he actually lives an hour from me here, but, but he, um, he also kept notes. So we were kind of blessed that way, you know, with, uh, and plus it's, you're young and it's such a, um, um, I, I've described it before. I used to speak to a lot of high schools, but the power of that at a young age is very intoxicating. You know, it's so your my memories anyway are vivid. You know, they're they're just uh, and and I don't know if it was there or somewhere else, but I I learned early on to just kind of be a student of life, you know, and watch people and and uh i got my hand i i got to hand pick the guys that went with me on my team and so i watched people very carefully because i i only want the best that was going to have my back <laughs> absolutely <laughs> like i i had one uh and we're still friends to this day and we laugh about it but at the first reunion we ever got together uh, he was Italian from the East Coast, and he was just loud. You know, he was funny. He's fun to be around. But I took him out like once, and <laughs> we called him Meatball. I said, "Love you, man, but you can't. You you're just too loud." You know that. And uh, and darned if he, fortunately he you know survived. But he he went out with another group and was goofing around and set up on a gravestone and got sniper guy you know, oh. in, the, in the shoulder, you know, so oh. thank God he lived, you know, but we laughed about it when we got together, but, uh, wow. but you got to have, you got to have people 
that have your back, you know. That that is uh, especially uh, we'll get into your first uh, combat experience with uh, Santo Domingo. But uh, after your experiences there uh, in the book, that immediately comes through that you after what you saw and what you went through personally, that you wanted to a be with the best. And like you said, learn from the best because yeah. they're immediately you find out you're you're not only when you get to be scout sniper, but you're officially a scout sniper, uh, and the 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 recon guys or the idea is is floated at first, and you immediately said absolutely, whatever I can do to learn to be, be better in the woods, uh, I'll do it, and uh, we'll get to that. Uh, but could you? Uh, I'm always interested. My father, uh, he was a Hollywood Marine, San Diego. Um, could you speak a little bit about what the island, Paris Island, guys, for y'all for y'all don't know about the island. Uh, could you speak a little bit about what it was like uh, in the hard days uh, of being a Marine, as they say, uh, at, at the island? Well, it was, uh, I'll tell you, it was a shock of my life. Uh, I, 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 uh, <laughs> I, you know, they, they used to say, I don't know if they still do that people went in the Marine Corps for, I think it was one of three reasons, but it was, uh, cause they thought they were bad because the courts told them to, or because they wanted to prove something to themselves. And mine was to prove something to myself, you know, and I was, uh, I like to say I was, uh, I was raised in a dysfunctional family before they talked about dysfunctional families, you know. but, uh, but I didn't have a tough upbringing or anything. I had, I had a mom and a dad and I had an aunt that grew up my whole life lived with us. My grandmother, a whole life lived with us. And, and uh, so I, pretty much ate whatever I want. You know, I mean, it was just, you had family also to jump in. You, you're, you had fa family experience or family members that served in combat yeah. as well. Did you not? Yeah, I did in the army, my, my uncles and they would, they would come in and out of the house, you know? So it was, it, it was, it was, I was blessed. You, when you, when you look back, you know, you didn't think so then, but when I got to boot camp, um, it was <laughs> it was a shock to say the least, and I wanted my book to be transparent. You know, just what you see is what you get, and so I disobeyed an order uh, early on, and uh, <laughs> and I uh, I was sent to the dental office. You know, because everything was everything was one hundred percent structured, and there was a di that slept with you. There were three DIs and there, you had three during the day and one at night. And you were absolutely, you went to the bathroom when they told you, you went, I mean, it was just total control. And, uh, so I was, uh, I was told to report to the PT field after, you know, after I had, uh, gone, <laughs> Uh, to the <laughs> dentist and the dentist was canceled for whatever reason. So I came back and thought, well, I'll hear him because we used to have to sing running, you know, and I'll just run out, you know. So I got in my PT gear and laid on my rack and they weren't born yesterday. And this drill instructor came in and I mean, just went berserk, you know, and, uh, slapped me around a few times, you know, with an open hand, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, uh, I, and I just thought he was nuts, you know, because mm -hmm. holy shit, you know, excuse me, but, but, it's uh, fun. It's fun. and, and so when, when the platoon got back, I'm standing at attention in the hallway, you know, and cause we had the old barracks down there, then the H barracks and, and, uh, he, uh, the other DI came up and my lip was bleeding, you know, from getting slapped. And he, the other DI, I'll never forget, came up and said, he hit you, didn't he? He hit you. You, you let me, I'll take care of him. Now. No, sir. Mm -hmm. I, I no, no. You know? 
and before, smarter than that. <laughs> oh yeah. And before I, I knew what happened. I had had, they call it office hours and, and uh, I was sentenced to 10 days in corrective custody, which I had no idea, you know, what that was, but the MP showed up, handcuffed me, you know, took me out to the end of the Island. At that point, that's where the rifle range was, but it was out near the, where the swamp was and everything. And, uh, and they, I can't remember the one platoon, but they were the H barracks, you know, where there were two up, two down and, and, uh, and when I got out there, I found out they had corrective custody platoon for people like me. They had a uh, fat man's platoon for people that were overweight and couldn't keep up. They've probably done away with that today. <laughs> but, <laughs> and then they had motivation platoon for people not sufficiently motivated. <laughs> and, uh, and so there were 10 or 11 of us in, uh, in, in the, uh, and I actually thought it was an insane asylum when I went <laughs> <laughs> because the MPs took me in and boy, it was, uh, quite an introduction. And, uh, but in the end, and, and I sure I cover this in the book, but I, I didn't like that either, you know, so I tried to take off, you know, and, uh, <laughs> I, I can confirm that it is actually an island. <laughs> and I evaded it. I evaded them for three days and ate out of the garbage cans and, and uh, was apprehended after three days. And that drill instructor that I thought was completely, completely out of it, uh, that we had out at corrective custody, he is the one that ended up changing my life because uh, when the MPs brought me back, I thought he's just going to beat, <laughs> beat the crap out of me and I'm going to the brig, you know? And uh, he just, he, I mean, I was eaten up, you know, and everything. Uh, he was kind of amazed that you, that you were able to yeah. do this. Yeah. Well, he, he actually said to me, I'm a recon Marine and I don't have to do that shit, you know? Because I really didn't eat, I drank water out of the swamp and stuff, you know, and, and so he, he literally kind of threw me in his office and he said, Hey kid, what's your problem? And, and then, uh, he, he said, you want to be in my Marine Corps? And I said, yes, sir. And he said, well, I'm going to give you the break of your young life. And he did. And I flew straight and, and, uh, everything was great after that, you know, but, uh, and so I'm really I, I was never able to find him again, but a, a funny story is that one of, when I went back to the regular, you know, boot camp and stuff, one of the drill instructors was Staff Sergeant McGinty, John McGinty, who later won the Medal of Honor. Legend. He's mentioned in the book. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, so years later, I was traveling for business and I, 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 quit drinking when I was 28, but I, uh, I saw him on a history channel and telling his story. And I was actually with recon in the mountains when he, when that happened to him, you know, at helicopter Valley. And, uh, so I sent my book to him and just said, you'll never remember me, but you know, you helped change my life and stuff. And, uh, one day I'm home about three months later uh, and I sent it to the, to the uh, Medal of Honor Society. That's how you got it to him. And the phone rings and I answer it and he, and I hear this voice, Kugler. And I go, yeah. And he goes, McGinty here. And I said, for real? And he says, for fucking real. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and so we had a great conversation, you know, and stuff. And he told me the name of the guy that, I was talking about and uh yeah that's that's him and uh and I described him because I saw him we all came back after that op and he was down in the valley you know winning his medal you know sort of surviving and I was up on the side of the mountain but but he uh he told me he said because uh, I was amazed what they ended up doing and and uh he said uh oh don't be impressed he said I was just staying alive, keeping my men alive. And he said, always remember this. Anytime you see a medal of honor, that means somebody higher up fucked up. <laughs> yeah. and, and he's right. 
you know, if you talk to like Dakota Meyer, you know, I know him uh, and, and uh, uh, his story uh, that hit those two, especially the, the way you uh, parallel it. I mean, he, you, y'all meet, I'm not going to go into detail because yeah. guys, you need to read it, but he's actually in, I believe your he had taken over or was a sergeant in your original unit or was it Zulu's when they were facing in Hastings, Zulu. I believe Zulu's. Zulu's. Yeah. And they were, he, he literally survived, uh, wasn't it a human wave assaults? I mean, well, the bugles yeah, and everything. I, yeah. And what happened there, there's not been much at all written about it, which always surprised me, but, but what happened for the, the, it was the first, uh, face to face battle in the DMZ with the North Vietnamese. And it was the 324th B division of the North, North Vietnamese army and the DMZ. And so they went in and there were supposed to be four waves or four choppers in the LZ at a time, you know, the, that was scoped out. And it was scoped out, as it turned out, by Force Recon three months prior to the actual assault. And so in the interim, the Marine Corps switched from the old UH-34 helicopters, you know, the single blade they switched to the sea knights with the double blades or Chinooks, the army called them. And they were too big. And so they were dual blades. And when the four choppers went into the LZ, they all hit blades and all four choppers went down, blocked the LZ and nobody could get in to help them. And so they were in there for three days surviving. And it was, uh, I think he told me, maybe 60 guys, but only 11 actually came out and all were wounded and he was wounded two or three times. And, and, uh, and he was funny because he told me, you know, it's embarrassing. He said, because there at the end, he says, I had to crawl around to dead Marines with a helmet and get their ammo and then crawl to the next Marine. <laughs> And he said, and I got shot in the ass doing that. <laughs> but, uh, he, I mean, you said he 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 looked like uh, oh. he, you had him as a DI, and uh, you almost didn't recognize him coming no, up he, on him. His face when I saw him when they got him out after three days, uh, because I, me and and Zulu happened to be at the little airstrip at Dong Ha, and the choppers started coming in, and they were just loaded three feet deep with bodies, and so, and we had to sort them out because some were alive, some were dead. And he came off of one of those shoppers and is walking along and he just, he looked, he was gray, you know, his face, you know, he would, and I described him as an ashen face. And when he called me, what, the first thing he said to me is what the hell's this ashen face? <laughs> <laughs> so it, it was like talking to him in boot camp because he was exactly the same, you know, but, uh, but it, the, the Marine Corps in my case, it did, completely changed my life and put it on the right course you know and it wasn't the uh the 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 gunny i'm going to show one more picture that is uh the the cap or then captain uh mcginty i believe yep. and that is sog uh legend uh bob howard and gosh i've got uh uh, that is Gary Latrell on the far right. Uh, another SOG. Well, he helped out SOG, but he was a, a yeah. A team uh, special forces. But that's yeah. uh, he's in good company right there. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, could could you uh, Gunny Tarawa? Is, is that the one that ended up changing your life? Uh, yeah, what, he was he was the guy in charge of uh, uh, corrective custody platoon. You know. And you can't forget him. I mean, he was just a grizzled old. He'd been busted several times. And McGinty actually told me when we talked, his name was Sergeant Rex, R-E-X. And he said, and, and he used to do this in, in our squad bay at corrective custody. Uh, our job in corrective custody, they had a running track out back. And of course we ran on it, but our job at corrective custody every single day was to take this giant sand pile at one end of the inside of the oval and move it to the other end. We had two buckets and, and we just all day long, we had to carry these two buckets down and put the, <laughs> put the thing back down there. And, uh, and when we would go to uh, chow, 
uh, we were there with other Marines because they were on the rifle range, you know, so that's where we were out that way. And we, in our case, we were not allowed to ever wear our soft cover right. We had to wear it sideways, backwards, you know, something, you know. And we would go through the chow line and they didn't, that they didn't screw with us, but the fat man's platoon, honest to God, the DI would be behind them going, you don't get that. You get this, you get <laughs> like, they didn't have a special diet. They just, they just, and, and the fat man's platoon, honest to God, just ran and exercised all day. That was their job, you know, and ours was moving this big pile, you know, and, uh, but uh, it, Paris Island was, uh, was, it was something. It was a shock. I'll tell you, it was a shock to my system. You know? were, were the uh, gold footprints in effect yet, or were, was that after your time? That was after. I think it was after. I, I don't remember those at all. I know? think it, I just saw something. I, it may have been 65. I just had it, but I think, I think it may have been 65. They may have, so been, there. They may have been there. I just, I just, uh, I, I find that to, to be interesting. I've got some buddies that went to the island and they knew once they got to the footsteps there, the, it was over yeah. with. It's, it's a, it's, it, you're, you're in a whole different world. <laughs> oh, it, it was, yeah, yeah, it was complete, you know, but the, the thing I would say is, you know, like even my thing where I, I disobeyed an order and didn't, you know, didn't go report as I was supposed to, that came uh, full bore to me in Vietnam when we were out and I got a couple of guys wounded and I had to take a couple of guys with me that I didn't want to take with me, you know, that were new. And we're going up a draw, which we'd been ambushed before. We always moved at night. And, uh, and a guy behind me tapped me on, you know, I mean, and this was one you had to be just soup. You couldn't breathe. You know I mean? It was a tough place. And one of these new snipers just announces he has to make an emergency head call, you know, mm -hmm. and, and I can't yell at him, you know, I mean, I'm in the middle of, and pretty soon I aborted the whole thing because he took a crap and you could smell it, you know, and, Oof. and I, and, and that's where, that's when it hit me. That's why they're crazy about this, you know, this, this minute stuff, you know, and, uh, uh, and, and so that was, you know, that was interesting, but, uh, taking a dump and right there and blowing oh, y'all's cover. Oh, oh, it was, my. it was, I just, um, I never, I never took him out again. Uh, yeah. I was about to say he, he, he buried himself in your, uh, in your eyes, so to speak. Oh, yeah. uh, <laughs> um, before, so, since we've got a, a good bit of questions already coming in on Vietnam, I'd, I'd like to at least speak a little bit okay. about Santo Domingo because that is very interesting. Not a lot of people even know, uh, to be honest, I hate to admit it. I didn't know much about it at all until I read your book. Uh, could you speak a little bit about what what was going on? I mean, I know they'll read the book to get the, the yeah. full skinny, so to speak. Could you explain a little bit what y'all were tasked with, so to speak? Yeah, we uh, we were actually uh, we were actually in Guantanamo Bay, just stopping on our way. We were heading to Panama for jungle training, and this was before you know Vietnam, and. Uh, we uh, there was an uprising in Santo Domingo, Dominican Republic, where uh, rebels, you know, whatever they that's what they called them, had tried to have a coup and toss out the president. And so we were put on our back on our ship and steamed down to Santo Domingo and and landed. And we were supposed to, which we did, you know, take back the radio they took the radio station and they took the hospital and you know some different things and so we uh i was with third battalion six marines at the time india company and um and so we did a unopposed beach landing and then we went into the city and and uh we were tasked with you know with going in and and uh 
so we got in columns, you know, kind of probably like Baghdad or something. We had a tank or two with us and all that. And um, we took the hospital, we got the hospital back. It was pretty easy. And then we went over to this old Santa Domingo, which there was a new Santa Domingo and an old Santa Domingo. And, um, and it was a construction area to get there. And, and we got pinned down by a 30 cal on a rooftop. And um, I naively, you know, honest to gosh, we were working our way across this open field with big mounds of dirt to hide behind. And, and uh, they sent Amtrak's out because that's what we, we landed in. And I thought, wow, they're going <laughs> to, they're going to rescue us, you know? And, uh, and they turned them around. So the 30 cow couldn't shoot in them. And then they, we all jumped in our Amtrak. And, and then they turned open the freaking gates. Well, that was one of the stupidest things that ever. And so the 30 cows blazing. We ended up that day with uh, four killed and 36 wounded uh, taken back. And one of the things that happened um, that I began to see there, you know, leadership on the ground is like I had no issues in Vietnam with leadership on the ground. I had it above me. But um, in Santa Domingo, we we uh, were not allowed to use the tanks. We're not allowed to. The, we had rules of engagement, hand grenades and rifles only. You know, I mean, we could have that that tank could have taken that 30 cal out in a heartbeat, you know, but wasn't to be, you know. And um, so we had a lot of um, unneeded casualties, you know, for uh, for nothing, in my opinion. But uh, so that was that was my first uh, first encounter with combat. It was pretty, pretty wild. That, that, that's that's one of the immediately as soon as uh you know it, it's very interesting because this is still when y'all are taking cruises uh as a matter of fact a, a, another med cruise will come up later but um as soon as y'all got off the boat a you know i believe y'all were greeted by locals i, I think yeah. like locals yeah. were greeting y'all so at first it, it didn't seem all all that dangerous and then as y'all progress forward you started realizing the tanks aren't going to be able to get into play this is going to get bad uh so it, yeah. it, it you you get that point across very quick that this is uh excuse my language guys but it's going to be a clusterfuck yeah and and it really was you know our our captain got relieved of command and i i never i I felt like that was the right thing. You know, I didn't know everything he did. He, he, but he was a little gung ho without the, you know, without, I mean, we had two vets, uh, you know, combat vets in our outfit and, and both of them were Korean war vets. And, uh, when we were in the Amtrak's, I'll never forget going bobbing our way into the shore. They told us we would just be greeted, you know, but well, uh, we see all these people standing there with rifles, you know, and, uh, and of course all of us, most of us were out of boot camp, you know, so we're all fired up about this opportunity that we had. And these, these two Korean war guys are going, you just don't understand. <laughs> and, uh, but it turned out it was the Dominican so-called Dominican army that, that greeted us there. But it, yeah, it was weird when we started out for the hospital, people, people were actually out watering their lawns as we go down the street and they're waving at us, you know, and we're like, what, what is this? And then at the hospital, we started taking fire, you know, but, uh, but it got really ugly over by the radio station. It, uh, and I had a, uh, at that point I had a corporal that was, uh, you know, nice guy, but he'd spent his whole career in the Marine Corps, he was sea duty Marine, you know, so this was his first combat thing. So he had never even, I mean, I, we all went to infantry school, but, but he, he just kind of 
went wild because two of our guys crossed the street and this machine gun w went ripping down there, chipping up wood. And one guy went to boot with, took two shots to the throat and he fell back and he was, his eyes were open. I knew he was dead, you know, and the other guy took the throat cause it was a high, high scrape through there. And, and uh, so two guys ran out and got the one that was alive and this corporal's yelling at me and my fire team guy to go, you know, to go get the other guy that's dead. And I said, let's get the machine gun then get him, you know, cause he's dead. He's sitting there, you know, and he gave us a direct order and that's how me and my partner got, got wounded was going out and getting him. And, uh, it's just, um, uh, well, I mean, it's chaos, you know, but uh, a lot of things could have been done better, you know. Yeah, I wanted to. Uh, and guys, when he was uh, I meant to show this when he was telling his Paris Island story, I'm going back in time again. But there uh, and that's in 56, as you can see, there is uh, the island and it is, in fact, an island. And if I remember correctly now, my friends tell me now that when you're going to the island that you have to put your head down in between your legs to where you can't try and spot any ways out or any landmarks that you can keep in mind. Oh, and oh I, yeah, get I, there. I, I didn't know that. I, I, all I remembered was the causeway, you know, that went in and I knew that was the only way out. And, uh, and uh, when I, when I, peeled off from the group I was with in uh, corrective custody. Uh, I, I went down to the water and I had to hide literally up to my eyes. I just had to lay in the swamp and, and my, my corrective custody mates, there was 10 because there was 11 of us total and the DI are going up and down. And, and when they finally gave up looking for me, the DI goes, Private Kugler, have fun with the alligators. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, I, I'm still uh, that that that's a really good first parter because I mean it lets you know you're uh, you're already getting ready to uh to 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 be out there um, by yourself for a while. Uh, yeah, that's a oh, that's yeah. a wonderful one. <laughs> um, we're uh great question, guys. Keep them coming. We're getting into Vietnam now. Um. Can you uh, kind of let us know what it was like? Uh, at, well, you've already done Santo. You, you've gone back. Um, I believe it's not too long when you get home, you go uh, sign or ask to go to Vietnam. It's okay. And you go, I believe you're on the ship again and y'all go straight. Uh, do y'all go, where do y'all actually go into uh, the, the ship? We went to, we went uh, out of, you know, out of California, I imagine San Diego, I don't remember, but we went and stopped uh, a night in uh, Okinawa, and then we went into Da Nang is where we, we went, and then we spent the first night, we got off and spent it right somewhere around there. Next morning is when they came looking for sniper and we would have been divided. Otherwise we'd have been just replacements for guys rotating home or died or whatever. You know. Yeah. That's uh, I, I remember my dad telling me that that's exactly what he was. He got off after a night of sleep and wherever I think he yeah. called it the Denang Hilton, which was a, just yeah. a nomenclature for a, a shitty little area they were sleeping and he was immediately picked up by uh lima three five and they had had a bad time during operation allenwood um if i'm not mistaken this is where we first encounter uh is it uh is it sergeant right uh or both Ryder and um uh Dubier, gosh yeah. Dubier. Dubier. are they both the gunnies or is uh yeah. Ryder a captain no, no, both were, uh, one was a gunny and one was a staff sergeant actually and became a gunny soon after. But uh, they were both uh, Marine rifle team guys and, and um, seasoned, you know, uh, guys. Uh, I remember we used to think, uh, actually, Sergeant Ryder is actually uh, Walt Sides, uh, who is the 
one of the founders of Rolling Thunder out in uh, the DC motorcycle ride. Wow. Yeah. And what, uh, what did you say his real name was? I'm trying to write him off. Uh, Walt Sides, S I D E S. He was, uh, he retired from the Corps after 22 years. Uh, wow. Okay. And he's, he's been involved out there in DC with uh, Rolling Thunder since the beginning, you know, and, uh, uh when we got reconnected, he, uh, uh, he had what was left of us, you know, out, we would go out and be with him from about 2004 to 2012, somewhere in there. We, we got to reconnect with him and the rogues would go out and he'd take care of us out in DC. And, you know. That's so good. That, that's, yeah. that's awesome. Wow. Uh, so what was it like uh, there? You're, you're, you're finding out that they're, they're tr forming up a, in, in uh in country sniper school and you're uh, you've got the credentials to, to get in the door. What, what's that like? And uh, what, what's going through your mind after meeting uh, the two sergeants and the gunny or the, the, the gunny? You know, it, it's funny. Dubia was, um, uh, uh, the older of the two, you know, and, uh, and he, he really sides, you know, writer in the book, Sergeant writer in the book. Um, he was the tough guy and he was, he is, he's, he's six, four, he's a, he's a big, he's a Marine to Marine, you know? And, uh, but boy, he, he was hard on us, but he took care of us. You know, he, and Dubia was, he was almost, I describing him as grandfatherly because he was just a nice man and he felt terrible about every time he'd have to send us out, you know, and, uh, and he ended up dying in Quezon on his second tour. Uh, oh God. And so I'm, I've been in touch with his wife and kids for probably 20 years now, I guess, you know, uh, his son, you know, and, and good people, you know, she never remarried, but, you know, raised the kids and, and, uh, but, uh, w but what, what it was like, it, we, our school was 30 days of, uh, we got a choice between we, here's, and, here's actually our first question. If you'd like to build your answer off of this, can okay. you actually describe sniper school subjects? What was yeah, the standard okay. that had to be met? All right. Our sniper school, uh, there was one, there was a group at the same time being trained down in July. So we were the first one since second world war. We we're the only ones trained in a combat zone. And so ours at Fubai was, right outside the little Fubai base at that time at the air, yeah, the airstrip there and stuff. Uh, they, the engineers went out. Okay. And a little kind of flat area with, with hills, you know, some hills around a little space. And they set up our targets were uh, 105 canisters, 105 artillery canisters setting on a uh, metal uh, fence post, fence stake, you know, about four or five feet high. And so they were set up at 400 meters, 500, 600, all the way out to a thousand. And what we would do is from six in the morning to four at night, every day for 30 days, sides and Dubier would take us out there with, six buys and we had a partner and yeah that canister on the right that's exactly and they would turn that upside down set it on a fence post and the theory was that that was about 22 inches by eight inches and that'd be a chest you know that'd be the mass of the body and so we'd pair up we had a partner mine was zulu and you'd be with him every day and you would shoot for 30 minutes, spot for 30 minutes, shoot for 30 minutes, spot for 30. That's all we did. That was our training for to be a sniper 30 days. Wow. Now we were, we were called scout snipers. So we were supposed to 
which we did occasionally, you know, walk point for grunts and different things. But, but our other training was we got four hours of forward observer school because I could actually and did often call in airstrikes and stuff, you know, but I, I had four hours of training and we had landmine warfare and demolitions, which was two hours. And that was school. And to pass the course, you had to hit eight out of 10 at all those ranges out there, including a thousand. And you had to, we had, they had the Gunny Dubier and, and sides had uh, those 20 power ships, telescopes and stuff set on tripods and, and they would watch, but, but that was sniper school. That was, there was no philosophy. There was no, uh, and the original thought was we would go out in pairs and, and the grunts, you know, cause we worked at the regimental level. We were, uh, we were in the headquarters company of the fourth Marines. And so we were in theory supposed to support first time, second time, third battalion, you know, but, but uh, they were, nothing worked quite that way. And then what you found out real quick was that, you know, you have two different priorities, you know, the grunts have one priority. If you're with them and there's an opportunity you get it, but otherwise you'll, you know, they're just two different missions and they're very noisy and, you know, they're kind of ready to rumble, you know, and for us to get a shot, we got it. So that's how the rogues came to be is we worked at the regimental level and we had a Lieutenant who was in the headquarters company. I think he was probably in charge of it. And he was technically in charge of us, but never went to the bush, never had anything to do with us. You know, we never even seen him, you know. And so our sniper school was, uh, like I said, six, six in the morning to four at night. And at four at night, when you got back, you know, to Fubai, uh, sides expected you to show up down at the club. And one of us had to win the chugging contest every night. <laughs> you know, that, that was a requirement. <laughs> so that, that's uh, a very interesting <laughs> part. And it not the first time you actually meet someone was was them winning the uh the drinking contest. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'm it trying was, to uh, so was when, that whenever, whenever uh we got out of sniper school, Force Recon had requested two snipers you know so zulu and i uh just said oh yeah let's go do this you know and uh and i make the distinction in the book because there's so many people that want to be green berets and all this stuff you know i i i wanted to make it clear in the book that i i'm not force recon i had the opportunity to work with them for three months and I'm grateful for that because they were professionals, you know, they were really good. And, and I learned a lot and, yeah. and, um, it was, a it, it was a good experience, you know, it was crazy in the beginning, but, you know, because again, you know, the missions are different, you know, and, and so we, well, I cover that in the book, but, you know, we go out on our first mission and of course we realize they're just out here to gather your information and stuff. And it, the only chance you're going to get a shot is right before that chopper comes <laughs> on the 10th day. <laughs> and, uh, and then we got in a little firefight there at the first patrol we went on and it really sucked wind with that, uh, Winchester mile 70 bolt action. You know? <laughs> I'll tell I, you, man, I was man, just man. picturing you just running yeah. through the, that, that, that bolt action. I mean, it, it only held five, you know, and, uh, and being the Marine Corps, they, they wouldn't, we ask for sidearms, you know, 45s. We weren't authorized because the book said you weren't authorized, you know, so, uh, crazy that that, yeah, that was, was one of the surprises that was, that was sniper school that, that was, that's all there was you know wow uh there was 
Uh, yeah, right before that, you get a, you know, I'm, I'm not, I won't go into detail, but you get a little, uh, the, the gunny, I believe, ends up letting y'all, uh, have a little bit of a party, uh, and, you know, says y'all can party, but you, you better be ready to rock and roll tomorrow, and, uh, uh, y'all have a good time, and it only, uh, starts from there, and even, um, Gunny Dubay, which, like you said, he, he was a father, grandfather-like figure, yeah. You know, he was very, uh, in, in my opinion, he was apprehensive to, to want y'all to go over there. He, he didn't know yeah. if. He, he did it, not want us to go. And we, uh, what we did after the first patrol, when we were bang, bang, and, you know, with that thing, uh, we realized that they, what they had a new major, uh, the force recon did and he was pushing them out like 40 and 50 miles you know and just five of them and uh inserting them and you know they'd be out there 10 days and and so they they were being creative in how they could get more guns because you know they only wanted them to have five man patrols and so we kind of passed the test in that first firefight so we just made a deal with them and we would go over, we didn't tell our gunny, but we would go over to Force Recon for the patrol and we would put our uh, sniper rifles in their armory and and then they would give us M14s or whatever we wanted, you know. And, uh, and so we just became, you know, extra guns. Uh, but I learned a lot and uh, really respected them greatly and, so it served me well down the road, you know. It absolutely did, and you definitely give. Uh, I believe it was uh, the 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 guy you end on your first mission with Force Recon. Uh, was it Sergeant Lick, like L I C H? Wasn't it? Yeah, his actual his real name. I've never. I wish I could find him, but uh, his name was Rich R I C H. Uh, the okay. way the reason those names are screwed up in there is literally. 48 hours before the manuscript was due to uh, Random House, uh, this lawyer calls me up from Random House and says, do you have permission from all these guys? You know, and I wasn't using last names. You know, I was just using nicknames. And, oh, no, you got to have. And had I known what I knew about a year later, I would have said, screw it. Lot. Yeah. But he said, oh, you got to change these, you know. The, and so at the 11th hour and uh, the guy that in there, <laughs> the guy in there, uh, Wiener in the book. Yeah. OK, he just passed away about a year ago, but but he's over in Spokane, Washington. So he's not far from me, but uh, we were good friends, but he never forgave me for that, you know, because his his nickname was Buns. <laughs> And at midnight, I made a wiener. <laughs> I love that. That that that's a good little slip swap right there. Yeah, yeah. It was just, it was uh, creativity. You had while we're speaking of the guys. I mean, you had some really, really uh, interesting guys. I mean, uh, Zulu alone was was interesting enough uh, on his own. But I mean, uh, Deck Cord. Uh, wasn't Deck Cord? Uh, Men wasn't he in Mensa? Wasn't he Mensa yeah. qualified? I mean, he's a genius. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he was. Uh, he 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 would remind you. You know, and he still looks the same today. But he he kind of was a Tommy Smothers look alike. You know, and and he uh, was just spoke perfect English. You know, he he. And just knew all kind of stuff and and was a member of Mensa, but didn't have a lick of common sense, you know. But, I mean, I could have said to him, the patrol tomorrow is we're going to downtown Hanoi. And he went, oh, okay, you know, whatever, you know. And uh, so, but he got into explosives, and that's why we called him. Some people, his name was Dean, but some people call him Demo Dean. Some call him, De we call him Debt Court. But. We used to make him, we used to give him extra room when we were walking in a patrol because he was so wired up with all that shit, you know, that if sniper hit him, <laughs> but uh, he, yeah, he, he, was, he was a character. He was smarter than you can imagine, you know.
I, I that he he definitely uh I mean the the whole the and the rogues were the were a perfect perfect uh name I mean heck one guy uh he had a uh, MBA I believe also didn't he yeah uh, yeah yeah he uh, he was an MBA he was uh, very from a very wealthy family. He got drafted, so he said he wanted to go in the Marine Corps. They wanted him to be an officer. He refused. And so he was coming over as a grunt, and and uh, sniper school came up. He came, and the day I met him, he, he became my point man in the second kind of toward the end, you know, of my, my time there. And he was a, he was a badass, you know, but uh, very yeah. refined guy, you know, but just uh, – just you know hardcore yeah 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 i've uh i've i've uh heard some tales uh on on from jack about him that he was uh he was definitely a a, a bit of a wild man at, at some points in time oh so. yeah and then well then uh you know zip in there or harley i called him in the book but uh i named him when he came to our platoon i named him after the old beach movies, Eric Von Zipper, the <laughs> biker guy, you know, and uh, he grew up in a biker gang, you know, with a, just, that's how he grew up. I mean, he had some incredible stories and uh, he and I are still good friends. He's down in Texas now, but, but he, uh, <laughs> and he, he told me when I get home, you'll find me in Dallas or Seattle. I'm not sure what the, you know, the things was there, but I found him in Seattle and, uh, but he uh, rode with the biker gangs. He, I could write a book on him uh, alone, uh, but, but in, uh, in, in uh, Nam, he, he got his, uh, he actually got his, his bush hat shot off, you know, like, like he got a graze upside, <laughs> took his hat off. And uh, what had happened was he and uh, I think it's Stu in the book, but the big Iowa farmer, Boo, he just passed away a year or so ago. And um, they were with the grunts and they decided to stay behind when the grunts took a break and then the grunts took off. So they decided to stay behind and see if anybody was following them. And they got in the middle of a firefight between the Marines and, and the, you know, the North Vietnamese. The and they're in just the two of them and they got you know, gooks running by them and, you know, everything. And that's when he got his hat shot off and, uh, I wish uh, it was fun to get together with him because Boo was, he was six, three or four Iowa farmer, big guy. And, uh, and he, he said, he yelled at him. He, we call him zip and he, zip. We got to get the hell out of here. And he says, I'm hit. And he's of course got his hand. Yeah. He sees the blood and stuff. And Boo went over, <laughs> over to him and said, you got to get up. And he says, well, I'm hit. And, so Boo slapped him twice in the face and said, get your ass up. We're getting out of here. And they did. And then he found out it was just a graze, you know. But, uh, but uh, yeah, it was a, I guess today they call it eclectic group of people, you know. But uh, Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it, it was. It was uh, because Zip would would go anywhere and do anything, He, uh, as most of them would, they, you know. Yeah, they y'all definitely different didn't shy away. We we'll have some some stories about some of those. Uh, here's another part from from sniper or from your entry in. Apart from the M40, did you use any other sniper rifles? If so, what did you think of any of the other ones you used in comparison with the one you used? Well, we I I personally am not familiar with the M40. You know, I mean that may be the 30. I think that might be. What, here's what we had. We had a choice of a M1, uh, which only one guy tried, and then we gave it up. Or at the the first year we were there, we had the M1 or the Winchester Model 70 30 6 
and it had a four inch extended barrel and a heavy stock. It weighed 18 pounds. And we loved that thing. And then the second year we were there in their infinite wisdom, the Marine Corps decided that we, the Remington 700 308 was better. And their rationale was that we could have the same ammo as the M14. Well, we never had a problem running out of ammo, but, but they, they sent us match ammo from the United, you know, for our sniper rifles. So that was their rationale they gave us. So they took our our Model 70s, gave us all Remingtons. We didn't have a choice, you know, with that. And so we got those and we lost two to 300 yards with that. You know, we, we, uh, we didn't like them at all. Now, if that became the M40, I, you know, I'm just not familiar with that anymore. But, but so that's the only choices that, that we had. Uh, in sniper rifles. Wow. Okay. Uh, let's see here. Um, yeah, that uh, th that part about the y'all getting y'all's match grade am uh, hand loaded match grade ammo sent to y'all. I was amazed that <clears throat> amazed they were getting that to y'all uh, back then. Yeah, I mean, we that, did that get, was... yeah, we did get that. Yeah, you know. that's. Uh, Pretty pretty uh, interesting stuff. Um, oh, here's another one about some scopes. I know you only had a few, but did you ever use the Starlight while you were the, uh, in Nam? Yeah, the second year we were there, we we had those available, um, and they were pretty heavy back then, you know, and they were also really sensitive about them, like. You got you got a lecture before you got it because they didn't want it falling into hand, you know, like that you had to know you had to destroy it, yada yada. Uh, they worked, but one of the problems we had with them, we traveled really light because we snuck around at night and did everything, and we took one out. On speaking personally, we took one out on one patrol and never took it again uh, because one of the challenges it was very uh, when you looked into it it was very almost blinding you know it was so gray and silver you know and you could see i mean it, but i never we never shot anybody with one or uh, or i only we only took it once and it was just too heavy and cumbersome and we didn't take it again uh, so, it, but it was in the early days of that stuff, you know. It, uh, so it seems to be the common consensus amongst the the men we've heard from, uh, speak or at least had a little bit of uh, contact with it. Um, that that it was a pretty pretty cumbersome and pretty heavy. Yeah, unless I you think were if you were using it out of a bunker or something, you know, in a fixed location, it would have been good, but. Uh, but we just, we just, it was too cumbersome for us, you know. Yes, sir. And I had something on FUBA, but I missed that. Uh, Sean Thompson, uh, great book, Mr. Kugler. Oh, he misspelled a few things. Read your book when it first came out many years ago. He's a good uh, guy, Sean. He's a, a, a subscriber and a follower. Um, let's see. Oh, wow. Infantry's got some good stuff what methods of camouflage did you guys employ while in the field were ghillie suits around no the ghillie suits were unheard of at the time um and we we had the, the marine corps didn't give didn't we weren't authorized camouflage stuff okay <laughs> but <laughs> force recon was but we weren't and, but we all bought our own from the gooks in the area. You know, they they made stuff. I, I, however that worked, I don't know. But we wore tiger stripe uh, when we could get it. Uh, other than that, we would camouflage ourselves in place, but not, uh, you know, but only by crawling in a bush or something like that. Uh, we, uh, but there were no ghillie suits or anything like that. We... In fact, when I was there, we uh, we wanted 
because we decided the best way to get in position was at night, you know, to sneak out at night. And because uh, most of our shots came the first half hour of daylight or the first half hour of twilight at night. You, you get the guys moving earlier, the stragglers, you know, and um, we had other things in that, but that was where a lot of the shooting came in. And uh, so we needed face paint, you know, to, because when it was moonlight over there, it was friggin' moonlight. I mean, it was really, and so uh, we weren't authorized face paint. <laughs> you know? So supply wouldn't give it to us, you know. Ah, and, so mighty. and so my mother supplied my team for 18 months with face paint. She'd go to the archery store and ship it to it. What uh, a lady. We tried we tried charcoal, but it's hard on your skin. You know? Yes, absolutely. Gosh, I, man, what what a great mother. I, I hats she off did. to, to Miss Kugler. Wow. She did that and she sent us socks because we couldn't. There was time, you know, the supply just didn't always work right, you know. But, uh, yeah, she was – I I was blessed with one of those mothers. If you're in the Mexican prison, she'll be there, you know. Uh, but uh, um, – We had him clear up. The M40 is what he thinks the USMC designation for the 700 yeah, is, as far I as he knows. That, yeah. <clears throat> but we didn't – our experience with it, at least back then, you know, was, was if, if we were accurately shooting six, 700 yards, you know, we would be now accurately shooting 500, you know, or 400, you know, it just, we just didn't, none of us liked it, but. Um, I, I know the 14s come up and y'all, all the Marines loved them. Force recon oh, to, yeah. to grunts. Oh, yeah. Um, oh, yeah. did, did any of y'all ever think of, uh, putting a scope on the M14 and using it as your sniper rifle? Uh, none of us did. I, 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 I didn't see any, you know, that, but we never thought of it, but I loved the M14. It, it, um, I, I actually was. Um, I wanted to see one time how, uh, how, just how, uh, cause when we got our five man team, we would carry two, two sniper rifles and, and three M14s or four M14. And, um, and, uh, I wanted to see one time how long, you know, you could go without cleaning it, you know? And, and, and we would go, we would cross a river almost every day, you know, and, with a rubber lady and float across or walk across, you know, and uh, I don't know how long it was, but I remember we got in a little skirmish and mine, everybody else's was going, da, 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 and mine was going, da, da, da. <laughs> and the guys went, you better clean that thing. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's great. I, I mean, everybody I've spoke, I mean, they, uh, even when the M16s and some of the later guys that could trade for car 15s, they would have kept the M14 throughout the war if they could have. They loved them. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The, the M16 had, you know, and maybe it, I, I guess everything screws up when it starts, but there were, I was on operations that there were Marines dead with their their m16 apart in their hand you know and stuff operation swift sword is a notorious there's yeah, the book just, on that is yeah terrible. Just, uh you know and it was uh just rammed through that that one was actually rammed through by mcnamara you know with his wisdom you know with his kids <laughs> yeah um exactly. yeah that they uh, uh McNamara, God, don't even get me started on that, man. Um Daniel would like to know were did any of you ever use a silencer at that time in Vietnam? No. no or a suppressor, I should say. No. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't remember them popping up. I see the saw guys and some of the force recons every now and again posing with some, but I don't know how often they took suppressed weapons except for pistols out so yeah i i don't know i well, but i never saw any over there uh, 
Let's see. Oh, this is an interesting before we get into some more timeline. Um, did you ever encounter uh, VC or NVA snipers? If so, did you conduct any counter sniper missions on them? Um, we ran into, you know, I mean, we'd be shot at it by them, but, uh, I never had any, it, it wasn't, um, we were never set up at a place, you know, where they were going to snipe at us, you know, like, uh, yeah, I hear, or I read that, you know, in Baghdad and different places like that, you know, but in Nam, uh, the bases were so big and I, I wasn't on the big bases, but even Fubai and stuff, they, they were just set up in such a way you'd get a sniper now and then, but most of them, uh, in our area, which my area was Fubai way North. I was, you know, that's where my whole operational area was and the DMZ mostly, um, it we didn't you know like what my one guy i mentioned earlier meatball he got shot off of a pagoda you know <laughs> by a sniper but but for the most part they weren't uh, the the vc snipers just didn't have good equipment or or stuff you know so they weren't as deadly nva is different but we we never did counter sniper stuff and I think uh, in, in this sort of your neck of the woods up here. Yeah, Quang uh, Tree Yeah, Tuatin and Quang Tree. Yeah. It's a uh, hot, hot I core for those of y'all that don't know the uh, the four cores up 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 to, at the top is I and going through the numbers ending at four at the bottom of South Vietnam. Um. Oh, this is well. Let me get this out of the way because I knew this question would come up, being that you're a sniper. Did you know, or did you ever meet Carlos Hathcock? I didn't, uh, and I didn't hear from him, you know, until the book came out and stuff afterward. However, uh, Sergeant Sides, or writer in the book, uh, was friends of his and knew him from the rifle teams and stuff like that, and has. A, vouch for him being a good guy and stuff, but I, I didn't personally know him. He's definitely, uh, him and Chuck Mo Moini are yeah. uh, definitely, uh, definitely up there with y'all in the, the legendary status of the Marine Corps. Um, got some mis mess ups here. There's an interesting, although I think in the book you cover a little bit, what would you say your max range at which you could be sure to land a first round hit? Uh, probably 600. Yeah. I was about to say, I know uh, if I'm not mistaken, I, I believe you got one at 700 there on one, or was it two that it, it took you? I, I thought you got well, one I at seven. I have it confirmed at 1300. Oh, oh yeah. Oh yeah. But, That's a big one in the book. But that was six shots. <laughs> you know, and uh it was in the DMZ and uh, but as far as being absolutely sure, I would say 600, you know, uh you can do more than that, but it depended a lot on wind and uh, you know, weather and heat and uh, and how well you were positioned, you know, and stuff like that. But I think six is probably a pretty, we were pretty good at 600. And, uh, but the 1300 meter one was, was in, in the demilitarized zone. And, it, and we were actually with the South Vietnamese army at the time. And, uh, we were at Con Tien before it, you know, heated up quite like it did, but, but um, the guy was the, and and we found out that the South Vietnamese were running Contien at the time, and so we were sent out there as snipers, and then they wouldn't let us shoot because they didn't want to piss off the North Vietnamese, who they had a deal with, and so at night we would actually sit on that hill there, and my partner and I, and we would watch flashlights or columns of flashlights going south around Contien because the South Vietnamese were a deal, you know? And so we were out there for three weeks and, and uh, so one day we see, which we knew 
there was a there were couriers who I don't know if that's the right word, but there were guys who stored uh, food and stuff for the guys coming south. And so one of them was out in this area, and, and I knew it was 1,300 meters because it was just beyond one grid square, and there were three hooches there on the map. And so uh, I asked this Arvin lieutenant if I could shoot him and he laughed at me and said yeah yeah you know and uh, and so I was able to lay out on this roof of this bunker and really and had my spotter pearl and and my first shot the guy didn't even turn around he would come out of this little hooch bunker and and do whatever he was doing and uh, and so then I cranked it up again and I took a shot and and he picked it up, you know, but I was way short. He, he picked up where it hit. So I tried the third time and the guy looked around. And uh, so I knew I was getting closer. And uh, on the fifth shot, he actually ducked and, you know, ran back and we didn't see him. The whole thing took two hours because he would, once he started hearing it, you know, he'd go back. But on the sixth shot, I dropped him. And uh, the Arvin lieutenant was not happy with me, but, uh, but and so that's how I know. And, and, and he laid there; he was he was gone. But uh, but that's how I knew it was thirteen hundred meters on the thing. But but it was six shots and um, two hours and a a dumb North Vietnamese. A very very interesting story, and the the guys uh, y'all get a uh, a good a good play by play on that whole one. That's a very interesting, and really, you're. It seems like you had terrible, just terrible interactions with the Arvin. Uh, they oh, awesome. uh, aside awesome. with the deal up there on, that you were speaking about, they seemed like just terrible, terrible people. Uh, our experience with them and we had a lot of experience with them was you you question why we were supporting them because i had a great deal of personal respect for the north vietnamese because they flew me to fight and they had to walk 400 miles you know down and and uh, and they were disciplined you know i mean they would they would die you know they i mean some of them officers especially would take a grenade to the chest if they were getting captured, you know, kind of thing. I mean, they were, they were, they were down for the cause, but the Arvins were uh, to me a joke. I, they just, you know, I, and I don't understand that to this day, but it, they were. And uh, not to say all of them, but there were a lot of Arvin re units. That some of the SF and all of that were were okay. Uh, the LLDB, uh, but yeah. some of those I've regular read, I've read Arvin stories. Yeah, I've read stories of that. But boy, the ones uh, <clears throat> the just the run of the mill, you know, everyday grunts were. Uh, they weren't in it. They no. they clearly weren't in it. Uh, you covered your longest. Uh, infantry would like to know what was your shortest engagement with the sniper rifle. Um, well, my my shortest was about three feet <laughs> because i i had a I had an armor. We had an armor for our patrol or for our platoon. And he was a Hawaiian guy, and he was uh, he was a good guy. He was staff sergeant, Marine rifle team, you know all that. And this was a mentality, I, you know, of a war, I guess. But when he was getting ready to rotate home, he did. He came to me and said, "Can you take me on patrol? I've never been on patrol, and I'd like to shoot someone uh, because I'm on the Marine rifle team, and I hate to be a sniper armor and not, you know, and." Uh, well, I said, sure. So we took him out to one of our favorite spots that we always found people. And, uh, <laughs> and to our utter surprise, we normally had a two to 300 yard shot at this particular area and uh, literally 50 feet in front of us, an NVA soldier, very young. I mean, younger than I think I was 
and I was 19, 20. And, uh, but this NVA soldier pops up in front of us, just down this hill, just a little bit looking all around, had no idea we were there, you know? And so Sergeant, the, the Sergeant, uh, the Hawaiian is next to me. You know, we were camouflaged in this, these bushes. And so I reach over and tap him in motion, you know, there's your shot, you know, and, uh, he got up and he, he, his, well, I mean, he was, he didn't stand up, but I mean, he got his rifle to the ready and, uh, from a sitting position and he was shaking, you know, and, um, uh, I hit him again. And, you know, cause this guy's just looking around and I, I, he just couldn't be by himself. You know I mean? He was, he was in uniform, you know, had an AK and, um, so the second time, any rate, Sergeant Armour, he shoots, and it turned out he hit him in the leg. And the guy goes down and on his back, and he's yelling in Vietnamese. And I'm, I'm envisioning, you know, 20 guys running up over that hill, and we're toast because there was five of us. And so I just motioned for two of my guys to cover me and I just ran down you know ran down and I had my harness off so I didn't have any grenades or anything I had my rifle and uh and I came up on the guy you know from the he was laying on his back I could see his leg bleeding and stuff and um you know to shorten the story the end of the story is I got right to his feet and I've got the drop on him on he's laying on his back and he grabs his AK and pulled it up and pulled the trigger and it didn't fire. So I shot him, <laughs> but he would have got me if that baby would have fired, he would have got me. But, um, so that was my shortest. That, that was my closest. Uh, but we did have, you know, firefights and stuff that were feet, you know, but, uh, but normal, normal was a couple hundred yards, but uh, that wow. was my closest. Man, uh, between that one and uh, <laughs> that, that first patrol with Force Recon where you're just laying it out in the end of the bush with bolt action, I, I, them being within, you know, five feet of you, I can imagine on that ambush had to be absolutely mind blowing. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, it's, uh... <clears throat> Uh, the, the guys are wondering about, uh, since we're early in, uh, in, in scout sniper, uh, what, how are you estimating your range and wind from, from learning in South scout sniper school? Okay. What they taught us in school was if you can find a, a flag, you know, of any kind, they taught us that if the flag is, I, and I have no idea it seemed to work, but if the flag is straight out, that's 30 mile an hour wind. And then you judge it accordingly if it's moving, you know, up. And accordingly, treetops, that's the only way, the only other way, or grass, you know, if you could see it, but can't see that at distant. So you just, it was wild ass guess, you know. And then as far as distance, they taught us to flip football fields in our mind, you know, like just because most men are, you know, you can judge what a football field is. So you had to kind of guess if you had a map and it had, it was accurate, a topo, you know, map, you might be able to, but most of us just learn to do it by looking at it, you know. Yeah, uh, I I thought that was interesting. The uh, the the football method that or the football field method. That's uh, that's the way I was taught to to shoot by my dad, uh, deer hunting and all that. Uh, it it seems to be the easiest to to do, uh, at least for gauging you know distance. Yeah, when you ain't got a range finder and all that. Um, 
This is an interesting question. I don't know if you mentioned anything about that. Did you ever aid the agency or pull a perimeter for a secret mission for any of them to go in or something like no. that? No. no. Mm -mm. Imagine they, uh, the, the spooks, as they were known, they were doing secret stuff and trying to avoid getting into the 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 bush with the Marines. They were probably trying to say as secret as they could. <laughs> Uh, oh, this is a little interesting one. John would like to know, did you ever make it into the Oshaw Valley? I didn't. I uh, had an experience I cover in the book uh, where we were supposed to go to the Oshaw, but I didn't. Uh, the Force Recon teams I worked with, some of them had been in there, you know. Uh, but one day we were called to... Uh, they were going to have this big operation to go into Ashaw, which I think later became, uh, I think, what was it, Hamburger Hill or one of those. Uh, but uh, the Marines were supposed to go in and they had this foolhardy plan that they were going to airlift, you know, some ungodly amount of Marines in. And, and uh, uh, then they were going to drive some across, you know, low way there and um uh, but uh the recon team that was supposed to this was in our briefing the night before the recon team that was trying to get in there ahead of time got shot out i mean they escaped but they their chopper took a bunch of hits and and uh it was it was just a, i i detailed in the book but it, it was an insane plan and uh that uh, so i i was never able to send somebody to do something like that so if i didn't go and so there they needed six snipers so i took the rogues and just said plus one and we'll go and we were on different choppers and all that stuff but uh it was just insane uh so uh, I never personally made it in there. And I feel for the guys that did because they they knew that was just horrendous. You know, uh, like the LZ that my chopper had we went was supposed to go into was a a uh, any aircraft position on that hill. And I asked, well, what about the any aircraft position? And they said, well, we have to assume it'll be taken out. <laughs> you know? And I thought people are freaking nuts, you know, and, uh, but I had, a, I had a, a experience that, that has been with me ever since I, I convinced myself because we waited all night at the LZ to lift off at like Oh, four fifteen or something. And it was called off, but, um, but I laid there and looked at the stars. It was a real clear night. And I went through my whole young life at that point and convinced myself that I just wanted to go out fighting and it was over and tomorrow was it. And it was actually very freeing. And then when they canceled it, I was so pissed off. <laughs> you know, just the, the emotional roller coaster. I was just pissed off. Like I'm ready to die. And <laughs> Yeah, so you get after two years i got pretty crazy but you know our uh, our next question is interesting because you actually do have some some issues with this but uh before we lead into that question could you uh speak a little bit about because you are a recon or you're a scout sniper, a sniper, but they also realize you're a scout and you're going out with a rec uh, force recon team. You actually, I believe you and the other uh, snipers go through a quick uh, uh, booby trap and uh, EOD school of sorts, don't y'all? Well, we did for two hours. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, two yeah. hours. That's yeah, they what it called was. It, they called it landmine warfare and demolition, and that was that was when we were graduating. And uh, but we did get to where we would we walk point a few times for people, and we would. But what we did, and we called it uh, at the time, we called it blowing mines, and. Uh, 
and so you know debt cord carried all this crap you know the debt cord and the c4 and all that but it was time consuming and so when we would walk point it'd usually be me and somebody else for, for a grunt platoon or taking them someplace they needed to you know find their way to um and we found one we would just clear the air, you know, clear a running path and we would lay a hand grenade on top of it and run like hell <laughs> and uh, blow it that way. That way. It was a lot quicker than, <laughs> than firing the hole and all that shit, you know? So, so, uh, yeah, that, that was our next questions. <laughs> uh, tripwire, snap traps and, and all of oh, that. Yeah. Did, were y'all coming across punji pits and, and all oh, of that too? Oh yeah. Yeah. We, not as not as much as further south, but we we had them. Uh, I had a time when I walked across one that was apparently the guy wasn't. It was either old or he wasn't as exacting as he was supposed to be with his hole. But when I stepped on it, there was a, a dirt ledge that kind of came out, and so it hesitated before it went. You know, it went. And so I was able to go forward and catch my uh, my elbows and my feet went down the hole, but I didn't. <laughs> but oh uh, my goodness, sir! And the trip wires, they were you had to walk with such sensitivity to, uh, like uh, the one guy in the book, Hood. Uh, he was like a cat. He was he was my longest point man, and he. He, he was amazing. He could feel them on his uh, uh, boots, and yeah, he could feel them and and just uh, stop. And you still there? Yes, sir. I'm here. Yeah, I'm trying to. Did you move? Can you hear me? I can hear you. I when that. Doggone phone ring. I lost the. I'm sure it's on here somewhere. I just can't find it. Oh, I know where I'm at. Okay. I'm on Google. There we go. Uh, but uh, yeah, there were, there were a lot of, a um, lot of booby traps. Um, and they would, they would booby trap. Uh, like if, if a bomb dropped and didn't go off, they dig it out of the thing and then booby trap it, you know, so you'd, it'd be like those big IEDs, you know, that, uh, because, uh, a 500 pounder blows a hole, man. It, it's, uh, so there were a lot of, a lot of, uh, booby traps. Um, and, uh, and when we usually they would, do, a lot of times they would double booby trap it. Like, like you'd have the trip wire and then you'd have the, booby trap the explode you know the grenade or whatever and then if you just cut the trip wire or whatever and you move this they'd have 100 you know and they'd get you you know so you you just you had to learn you you just had to learn where to walk and where not to and to look for disturbed uh anything out of the way usually if there was a trip wire there might be a a stick or something laying across you know and then you, we could learn uh, sometimes uh, some areas were different than others but sometimes they would mark their their trip wires and stuff with uh, like a stone or two stones one on top of another so that their people would see it and uh and so you, we just you had to learn all that you know it was yeah. uh, and if I'm not mistaken, there's a, we can't get into everything in the book because y'all need to, to get it and read it. But, uh, there, I mean, there's one place that's literally called Booby Trapville uh, that, that is, is pretty hairy uh, with, with, with stuff going on in it that is just, yeah, yeah y'all definitely, uh, you going from a grunt to scout sniper uh, with Force Recon, then hooking up with some, uh, it, it's, you were in and out of a lot of, a lot of crazy situations that that it's absolutely for sure um and i one interesting uh fact that i uh actually keynoted right here uh did you help set up and actually find rock pile no we we um uh 
force recon. Well, the Marine Corps. Well, I'll go back beyond that. The rock pile sits. Uh, it's it's right at the edge of the DMZ. It's it's about a halfway from the from the. It sits along what was Highway Nine at that time, and it ran from Dong Ha to Kaesan. So it ran like along the top of there. About halfway in between was this this rock formation jutting out of the jungle. And uh, I think it was 900 meters tall, I think. I, I, maybe it wasn't that tall. Maybe it was 900 feet. But at any rate, the last couple hundred feet, it's just granite. You know, it was, it was just, there wasn't a flat spot on it. And so uh, they, uh, it was a radio relay thing for the military, you know. And so I was with the recon team that went up there the first time. And, uh, and so they took us up in choppers and, and uh, there were two peaks and then there was, uh, yeah, that's, they eventually built a little wooden pad like that you see right there. But when we went up there, there wasn't anything up there. And so uh, they took, they took us up and they couldn't land the chopper, you know, and, and there's winds ripping up there, you know? And so it's uh, yeah, the Razorback yeah, goes along that back edge there and the rock pile and uh, Operation Prairie, if anybody ever heard of that, was off to the right there and the, toward the Razorback. And, um, but the rock pile was a critical, you know, position. So we went up there and uh, there were five men and uh, Zulu and they had to just, have the chopper floating in the wind and we had to jump into there and there was just little pockets in the rock. There was, I mean, there wasn't dirt. There wasn't anything. It was all just rock. And, uh, so we, you know, we jumped, uh, jumped off that thing into there and, uh, spent three weeks up there and, uh, uh they would shoot, uh, uh, recoilless rifles at us, you know, up there. And, you know, if you know what a recoilless rifle is, it's like a big rifle, you know, and, uh, and they would, they, they never got the top. They would hit 40, 50 feet below us on the rock, you know, and then sometimes it'd be like a freight train going over us. You know? <laughs> and, and at night you just had to find a little place to sit in the rock and sleep. There was nothing flat. You know, I mean, it was crazy. And the only thing out there with us was rock apes, you know. They, yes. They were about yes. four feet tall. And, <laughs> and uh, they were on a peak just off from us. And uh, it was crazy. It was wild up there, you know. Was, well, one of the Marines uh, actually has a, a, a quite hysterical night uh, yeah. waking up to a rock ape. Yeah, we, you know, because the no we knew you know nobody's coming up there you know you know unless they're climbers or something but so we didn't we had a you know one guy would stay awake out of the seven you know but but one of the guys that was farther out you know the peak from the top just started screaming one night and a and a rock ape had approached him and started slapping the crap out of him you know and and he didn't know what it was you know it was a middle of night but uh, and those were uh, so we just disturbed the rock apes up there but it was way up there i tell you uh that those pictures i i mean yeah you and you mentioned in the book during the hysterical screaming you had to be careful because oh, one misstep and you're gone 700 you're gone. feet yeah it was it was just a you know it four or five feet wide probably. And then it got a little wider at one place, but there was no, nothing flat. It was just all rocks, you know, it was crazy. <clears throat> um, we've got a few questions about if you know any more uh, individuals and Mr. Bill would like to know, do you know a Jake Bowditch? No, I've not heard that name. Okay. I'm not familiar either, but I figured I would ask yeah, for everyone. Yeah. 
James would like to know, do you know fellow Marine Scout sniper Joe T. Ward? Joseph Ward. I don't know him. I I think there's a book. Uh, did he write a book? I believe he did. I think that's I was, how I know that name, but I didn't know him, no. But I think I've read that book. But I've got uh, – that's another thing, guys. I'm about to link uh, the Scout Sniper uh, – uh, homepage and all the books about scout snipers. Uh, so y'all can check that out. Um, we've got one or two more and then, uh, I'll have some, and I think we may close it out. I don't want to, we've had two hours or coming up on two hours. Uh, what was your SOP for staying in the field overnight? I .e. site selection, security, posture, sleeping arrangements. Um, well, we stayed as snipers. We we would stay out quite often, sometime up to ten days. But uh, it was always crawl into the uh, thickest thing you can find. That there would be tons of noise to get to you. You know, like a lot of times you just get on your belly and crawl in. And uh, if if there was five of us, two would be up at all times, you know, would be awake. And it was an hour at a time. Uh, but as far as sleeping, we carried nothing with us. We just lay on your pack or whatever, or keep your pack on, lay back. And, and you know, but we never, there was no, um, we didn't have sleeping bags. We didn't have tents or, you know, anything. You just may do, you know, <laughs> roughing it. <laughs> oh, wow. Um, yeah. At school one time, uh, one of the schools I spoke to, I used to like to ask uh, the kids, you know, that what's the longest you've went without a bath, you know, like you go camping, how long you've been, you know, and you get four days, five days. I went 90 days without a, change of clothes or a bath. <laughs> wow. I'm surprised you still had clothes still on you. They didn't well, run they, off. They were just black, you know, with sweat and rings. You just threw them away when you're done, you know, but it, 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 um, you know, one of the things we learned, and this may sound crazy, but um, like a water buffalo, for instance, in Vietnam could tell the difference between an American and a, uh, and probably a European, you know, but they could tell the difference between a Vietnamese and us and, and they would alert and all that stuff. And we just, we could have been wrong, but it seemed to work. We just decided that, you know, they don't get a bath and they, you know, they, they have no way to, you know, the Vietnamese. And so we just decided to smell like them, you know, and, uh, it actually seemed to work, you know, because, you know. Can't go uh, out there smelling like uh, Dawn or ivory soap and, and all that, yeah. shaving cream and, you know. Yeah. I, I, that brings up one. I, it's in the book, but I, I got to share it because it's so funny. But I got to go out, you know, I, I, we were back, you know, we were den generally 10 days out, three back, you know. And, and I got asked by Gunny Dubier to – grab a sniper and go on this security thing for us aid, you know, agency for international development. So we were somewhere around way. And so we just grabbed two M14s and we go out and we're riding out and they were pompous asses. The two guys, it was a guy and a woman, but, and so they just had these two six buys, you know, with Marine drivers. And, and so we pull into this village and, uh, and they start, and this is honest God's truth. They start unloading, and the first six by had big cartons of clothes donated by Americans, I'm sure, right? And so they're like frilly dresses. They're, you know, they're, they're anything, you know. And, the, and these Vietnamese in this village, I'm, they were very resourceful, so I'm sure they make something out of it, but they're, you know, they're holding this up. It was like a different world. They don't have bathrooms. They have dirt floors, you know, and stuff. It was like, you know, I said to this guy, why would, why would we spend the money? You know? Well, then the second six by 
and I'm sure, I don't know who makes Flintstone bubble bath, but it was an entire six by of Flintstone bubble bath, cases and cases of Flintstone bubble bath. And I said, this, this guy, why? He said, well, they're donated. We just give it out, you know? And my partner said, you got to grab some of that. Let's, wouldn't a rice patty look awesome with all these bubbles in it, you know? And, and those people lived off those rice patties. So we, I didn't let him do it, but it would have been funny, but, but it, it's so insane, you know, as a 19 year old, you know, I'm still sitting there going, this is nuts. You know, this is nuts. And it's so probably so much worse today, you know, than it was then. But that was oh. one that was one out of body experience. It was just like what are these uh, people? I, and then as a matter of fact, one of the last questions we've got that I'm holding uh will will it kind of ties into uh, today that, that you're it's things you're noticing about today that, that could be fixed. But um uh I had one or several things to ask before we start closing up, but uh, bu -bu 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 -bu. there was one inc one mission that I found very interesting because I think y'all had actually found a uh, was it an un I thought it was an underwater bridge or was it an actual bamboo bridge connecting two sides of the river? It was a bridge connecting two sides. Yeah. Okay. Did did y'all love? Uh, I forgot what y'all's mission was. Uh, did y'all just happen upon that? Were y'all set to maybe scope it out or destroy it? Or w what came of that? Uh, well, that was, if it's the one I'm thinking of, that was uh, in Vietnam, a colonel or above could declare an area a free fire zone completely, you know. And... Um, they would move, they'd go in with the infantry and they would remove everybody and they'd tell them and they'd build them, the CBs would build them something 10 miles away or whatever. You know? And so they made this area a free fire zone. And we were uh, with the grunts as they're moving these people out, you know, and it, because it became our valley, you know, then we were sent in there and told to shoot anything living, you know. And, uh, and they, they would cr build these bridges. This one, w you had to cross the river on a railroad rail, you know, the rail itself, the steel rail. And then they, they had put bamboo, like V handles on either side you know with a little rope running you know so it was kind of the v bridge but it was a rail well it was a monsoon so it was just ripping and so the the water was going about six inches over the rail and it's night and so they're shooting flares you know, illumination flares so that we can see to get out of this valley and get out of that water and go to the foothills you know and so we had to cross that thing, sliding your feet on that rail because you couldn't pick them up because the water was, I mean, it would, would nobody drown, but a lot of people, you know, busted themselves when they slipped and landed on that thing, you know? And uh, so it was, uh, but it was, a, it was long too, but it was a railroad rail. How they got it there, who knows? You know? I don't wow. Know. And I mean, I and I had forgotten about it when you mentioned about the, some of your your being out uh, for so long and being so dirty. But you really uh, have issues with uh, infections and your your legs that oh, are yeah. really really bad. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how that developed and and how you ended up being able to continue on patrolling? Well, the my very first patrol in Nam with recon, uh, you, you know, I don't know what they, I don't think uh, the uniforms are different now, but you, you know, that we used to blouse our above the boots, you know, and you had a spring, you know, and you'd put your trousers. In. And so my very first patrol in Nam, I bloused like that 
and there so there's a gap for your ankle you know from you because it comes up and i got leech bites just all the way around both ankles like that and then then i got the memo you know you blouse down you know i didn't i but um and so you could never get clean mm. And so those things would, and they're right at your boot top. So they would constantly just raw, you know? And at one point I did, I had to take a week off because they just got so infected and swelled up that I had to unlace my boots down to about two laces, you know? I mean, it was just, and so it just had this green, you know, pus coming Discharge, out. yeah. And so then they just give me salve and stuff like that. But uh, my wife could tell you that I had those sores. I was there two years and I got it on my first patrol and I had those sores. We got married a year after I got home and I had those sores on my ankles. <laughs> uh, like, I, like, I, it's a, it's a wonder you still don't, to be honest, because my dad till the day he died, oh, yeah. his, his from being in the, in the water, I've never seen, uh, respectfully, uh, more nasty feet and toenails. Yeah. I, I, it, it's uh, y'all's feet have to. I, I never yeah. understood how y'all did it. Yeah, the monsoon was uh, my first. I was there for two monsoons, and the first one, it rained twenty-seven days and nights without. I mean, rained without stopping and everything's flooded, you know, and you're just slipping, sliding ever, you know, I mean, it's just muck and, and, uh, but, uh, the second one wasn't, you know, quite that bad, but. Yeah. At the monsoon season, especially in y'all on patrol and there's no way to get out. And, you know, I, that, that y'all had to just fear, not fear, but just greatly dis disdain for monsoon season. Well, it, was, <laughs> I can't it, even... it was miserable, but, but you had to, you, you, you had to have, which all, most of the military has, but is in combat, you, you gotta have that black, that dark humor, you know, you gotta, mm -hmm. oh, oh yeah, <laughs> you got to, you know, to survive, you know, and, and, uh, Oh, yeah, we've we've definitely learned that uh, the, the <laughs> viewers from from some of y'all y'all uh, y'all definitely have a, a a good not a good sense of humor and a good dark sense of humor. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah you, you got to like like you said you put very clearly in your book as you are waiting to get uh, to actually get to to get a kill that you you need to be prepared. You've seen dead Marines, but you've not killed, and you have to make sure you, you know you're you're ready inside to take a human life well you know a funny thing happened to well wiener in the book you know i told you about buns and wiener but but him and his wife were over when i moved to montana i moved here in 2000 and he's from spokane so they came over at any rate and so him and i are well four of us are sitting at our kitchen table and, and we're laughing about things that happened you know like and his wife who is great she was great with him but she she comes over and puts her arm around me and goes coog you do know that's not normal to laugh about <laughs> i said well it is in my world you know <laughs> uh i love that that that's i mean that's uh but if you're not there you definitely won't no, find yeah, it funny yeah, but yeah. It, it sure as hell funny to, to y'all that are there <laughs> yeah you, you gotta laugh or you go crazy you know um casey wants to know what does coog's t-shirt say i can only see the top it says normal isn't coming back jesus is <laughs> <laughs> i like that one uh we may have to I may have to get that one out. I may have to get me a, a, a shirt like that. <laughs> Normal is not coming back. That's for sure. We're long past that ever coming back. Um, one of my favorites, um, could you um, mention or speak a little bit about the, uh, is it the Johan incident or the, the, the mission the, where y'all encountered the, the, the Johan? Yeah. Yeah. We, uh, we had this, one area we'd go to that was 
uh, the, it was just foothills, but we could camouflage ourselves in the grass really well. And it we learned later it was an infiltration route for the Battle of Way, but we didn't, you know, we didn't know that at the time. We just knew there were a lot more gooks going through there than there used to be. And so there was always, it was like the one 1300 yard I got, there's always guys who, even though this was a free fire zone, will live there to stock up all the food and rice and stuff for the guys coming south. And so this was 20 miles northwest away. And, um, and so we were really good. This was about three to 400 yard shots, you know, and there was a local there that we recognized, you know, and, and he was the one that would hide out there and mass all this stuff. And, um, and I shot and missed and each of my guys over the course of three months shot and missed this. We, it, it's like, we used to say he, he should be on the Olympic team, you know, cause he was, it was amazing. And, uh, we missed him for three months. It was crazy. We never did that. And, uh, so one day, we were out there and apparently they had the, the week before this happened where we we'd go out there about once a week and vary when we were there and stuff. And so we're in there and we did shoot. We got one guy and the whole tree line opened up on us, but they opened up on the hill next to ours. So we realized they didn't, they didn't know which one we were on. So we were good to go. And, uh, so we waited and, and, uh, and finally this, I nickname, I have no idea why, but I nicknamed him Johan and, uh, everybody wanted to get Johan. And so, uh, so we are shocked about three, one afternoon out of this tree line that was kind of round comes Johan walking right at our hill obviously trying to draw fire, you know, and, uh, and he, he got really close and we missed him and he turned and ran like the wind and they find, I forget which guy was shooting, but he, he finally got him. We finally got Johan, but it took us like three months. It was, it was crazy. You know, we rarely miss shots and, uh, all of us missed this guy. So I don't know what his mission was, but he, he was, he, he is, uh, by far the, in all of my readings, uh, <laughs> one of the luckiest, not only NBA <laughs> or VC, but soldiers in the Vietnam war without a doubt. I mean, he, it's almost like they were sending out him out there, like the duck shooters at, at, at the yeah. carnival, just to, just to catch fire. Yeah, they, it, it was, it was like, you know, this guy's got to be low man on the totem pole, you know, but, uh, but uh, that, that one was so, so wild and guys, he is just, uh, again, this book is just outstanding and it's got so many, I mean, they've got unbelievable already missions going in there, but uh, we can't give it away for, for those of y'all that haven't uh, read this amazing book yet. Um, I was going to say, oh, we've got one more question uh, to kind of tie in everything here. This is from a uh, GWAT vet, um, Grunt Proof. I'd be curious if he has witnessed all of our current failures in the GWAT uh, that we could have learned from their generation but did not. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, In fact, uh, when when 9-11 uh, happened, you know, and uh, uh, everything happened after that, I got my experience with dead center has been so positive. Uh, you know, I, in, in it, it came out in 98, you know, so it's over 20 years old now. And I have only got, I've gotten tons of emails and I've only gotten one negative, And that was that, how could you enjoy doing what you did, you know, kind of thing. And, and uh, you know, it is what it is, but, but, um, 
so I got invited and was able to take some of the rogues with me to Marine Sniper School out in uh, Hawaii in the early 2000s. And so from about 2004 through 2008 or nine, we would go out once a year and, and, uh, you know, and participate in graduation and talk to all the guys and everything. And to learn, well, I, I can't imagine the rules of engagement living with the rules of engagement those guys did, you know, over there. But but we've learned nothing, you know. I mean, it, it's just nothing, you know. It's it's sad because, you know, they're, you know, you realize over time that uh, – I think it was the end of uh, what was that movie, uh, Danny Glover, and uh, to where they flew the elephant in Dumbo Drop. Yeah, at the end of that, he has the greatest line. He says to that little Vietnamese kid that that uh, men, something to the effect, men very far away fight uh, cause these wars, you know, and we end up, and that's probably. I've spent a lifetime reading everything I can to just understand, you know, what I went through and, and the decisions and all that stuff. And, uh, you know, it's, it's sad what, uh, and the problem, the problem really is I try to tell people that, you know, guys driving big desks make the decision to go to war and, I've done a lot of research for my latest book. I mean, I did four years worth of research for that. And all these wars are about money. That's what it comes down to. They're, they're about money. And, you know, bankers, uh, Rothschilds and uh, J.P. Morgans and Chase finance both sides of wars, you know. And But as a young person, it's exciting. I mean, it is, you know, I, I don't know. It was, it was for all my guys. And, and when I went out to sniper school, you know, young guys are just full of it, you know, and you want to, and so, uh, but to answer the question, no, we, we haven't, I have observed it and I've studied it and we haven't learned anything because something happens when, when uh, the, like the military, well, today, that would be a whole different discussion. But but even after Vietnam going up, as they, uh, I'll give you an example. I was invited to speak to a force recon company that came up to Montana and were training in the Bob Marshall Wilderness, which is a big thing. Navy SEALs use it in different. And I got invited, there's 400 of them, and I got invited to speak. And, and uh, the major in charge, and he was experienced vet from, you know, over in Afghanistan, and all that. And this is when Obama was president. And he called me before the event, before I was speaking, when they were done over there. And he said, I, I've looked at your website. I've looked at <laughs> your, your writings. And I totally agree with you, but you cannot mention Obama in your talk. And I didn't intend to, but, but that. Tell me not to. Yeah, that. Oh, yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I know uh, he's out now. He retired. But a guy who actually joined the Marine Corps because of 9-11 became a sniper because of dead center and retired as one of the top snipers and Mick Skint is his name. And, uh, and he, he was teaching a airborne sniper course in Texas where they lease a ranch and, and they teach how to shoot from a helicopter and all that stuff. And Ted Nugent was in the area and long story short, they met and everything. And Ted Nugent asked him if he could, if he could, come to that event he was having he was teaching the fbi and so of course mick said yeah you you know and the white house stopped it the white uh, house would not let him come you know and 
and so it's way beyond you know what we ever dreamed today you know but uh, but no we haven't unfortunately learned anything and and you really uh when i see these uh, um trials that these guys have to go through for doing that stuff you know uh, it's just awful you know it's just awful because the military has become so politicized now oh. that it's almost not it, it, it's it's like another branch of the government uh yeah it, it, it's yeah. I, I just it's, that's a whole different topic yeah we we, we can't we can't even get into that because no. me and you both will go on, on a tangent <laughs> yeah. because I've, I've got somebody here in our home state that is an absolute disgrace i'll say it tommy turberville holding up the admirals and the generals being uh, brought in or having uh, being confirmed uh, absolute human scum. And I um, hate he represents my state. Um, but uh, sorry about that. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You got to be careful. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, I, uh, Oh, I know what I was going to do. We've got, because I don't want to give all, all, all the, all the stories away. It's just so, so dang good. Um, Mr. Ed was gracious enough to share some of his photos and to close it out, I was going to let him walk us through some of his photos uh, since we've got some amazing photographs from Mr. Ed. Well, that's, uh, that's me. And that was November the 10th in uh, 1966. And I'm holding a Chinese communist grenade that I still have. And I uh, tripped that in a firefight between my legs and it went pop instead of bang and it was full of water. And so it didn't actually explode, you know, but it was, it was right between my friggin' legs. I, I, uh... <laughs> but that was a, uh, one of the more scarier moments you've ever experienced. <laughs> oh yeah. That's my, I call that my rebirth day. Well, that was at sniper school. There was a pagoda area right out, like to the left of that would be our range where they set up their things. And so Zulu and I were taking pictures of that day. That is a beautiful uh, it is, yeah. pagoda setup. That is, that that's amazing. That's one of my, even though it's not an action shot, that's one of my favorite photos of you. That yeah. is a outstanding and i that's need to know that it was that's uh during your uh yeah, in, in sniper. country sniper school yeah. this uh these next two are really good photos <laughs> okay that's the last four of the rogues uh that's me on the right and then um that's i forget i think that might be which red is his name but hood is the, or the yeah that one is hood and then Andy is is here, but that was what we would look like. And then the guy taking the picture, you know. But um, and we didn't we didn't we traveled really light. I mean, we took a minimum amount of food and and a lot of hand grenades and a lot of ammunition. But uh, and how much ammunition were y'all taking for the fourteens? And uh, well, I, 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 well, we didn't carry much for the sniper rifles, but the the 14s, I think six, maybe six um, clips, you know. Wow. Okay, man. Y'all were traveling light then. Oh, no. Yeah. We, we our deal was not to stand and fight. You know, it was Snoop and poop and, yeah, yep. and get, get yeah. out of there. Yeah. Wow. That is a wonderful, wonderful photo. And then we've got another incarnation, I believe, uh, of the rogues or maybe this is just on a particular op. Okay. That is uh, me on the right. That is uh, Tomo in the book, Dan Ireland. He pat, and this is a guy with the MBA on the left. Oh, they wow. Were, yeah. Yeah. And, and y'all see them in their tiger stripe tops. Y'all are asking about yeah, it's whatever, it's whatever we could get, you know, that's uh boy, y'all look, uh, Y'all definitely look like some rogues in a group not to mess with. <laughs> well, the regular Marines wouldn't allow us to come to their clubs when we were back, you know, at the thing. 
So we'd go to the CBs. The CBs loved us, but I, I hear more good stories about the CBs than oh, any yeah. other group in, in, in Vietnam. They were great. Yeah, they I were mean, great. Yeah, they were between them letting any group party with them or them helping out building something oh, or for anybody. I, I mean, they, they just worked. I mean, they worked. They, they were good what guys. A, what a group. What a group. Oh, wow. I did. I've actually got your, uh, rock pile. Oh, photo. Yeah, I didn't. Okay. That is how they, that's how they did it. They would put two wheels as close as they could get to there, and you just had to get out. <laughs> and the with wind, the with the tail end hanging hanging oh, yeah. up loof out there, and the wind <laughs> was whipping up there. I'll tell you. Uh, and didn't uh, Zulu almost fall out? Uh, yeah, he he was. I jumped. I jumped out, and he was ready to go. And the wind took the chopper, and went, and he was hanging with with. Uh, uh, on the door with both hands, you know, just ready to step out. And it went swooping down through the valley and came back around, you know. Oh, uh, I bet he needed a new pair of shorts after that. Well, he was crazy, <laughs> so it didn't matter. You know? He Guys in the book, y'all y'all will not believe that, that <laughs> Zulu was a, a, a Marine. I mean, he is a character. Well, yeah, that was... That was the young me after they straightened me out. You know. What was this uh graduation boot camp before you headed yeah. off? Yeah, Paris Island, yeah. Wow. Looking uh looking looking mean and ready for action. And I actually managed to dig up one of the first uh I believe this is the one of the original scout sniper platoons on the island. Uh I think it may be I forgot where where they were. It was the Pacific, if I'm not mistaken. But oh, I think uh, it's yeah. I I think it's Saipan. Okay, that yep. Forty Thieves. That book. Uh, yeah. I believe it's okay. The guy, the guy right there. The guy right there. Mm -hmm. When I moved to Montana, his name's Bill Canupel. He's in the, he's in Forty Thieves. He was the platoon sergeant, and. I lived, I lived on Canupel Lane, and it's a wonderful story. He built, he built Canupel Lane on a mountain here in uh, Montana, and all of four of his buddies had houses. I bought one of those guys' houses when I moved to there, and Bill was still alive. He he died at ninety four. Holy and, cow! So he had. He he and and in my house I actually have pictures of it, but he built a massive stone fireplace, one of those with no mortar showing, in each house for his buddies from World War II, and they were all snipers right there. Forty thieves. That's a, the book about him. What's well, about the? It's written by the son of the lieutenant standing back there on the left. But Bill wow. was the platoon sergeant. That's no joke. Yeah, when I moved there, I couldn't believe it. You know, that is so. I, I can't believe uh, I had this photo, and it, that is so so cool. Uh, yeah, and that, guys, that's a you got to read Forty Thieves. Absolutely. Is, As a matter of fact, I'm going to link that in the show notes since we've spoken about it. Yeah, that is one of I've got it on the bookshelf over here, guys, and it is oh, one of it the is. best books written. It is, and Bill Canupel, I had the privilege of living next to him till he died for about eighteen years, and he he was a character. But he and what are the odds there you're living next door and yeah. living on the street of the yeah. original Scout Snipers? Yeah, a funny thing. I should have sent it to you for this, but um, I lived. I was the next to the highest house on this road, and I was half a mile up. And uh, so I put down, I had two acres down in front of me. And so the road came by that. And, and so I had this four by eight sign made and it was all, it was in tiger stripe and had a Marine Corps emblem in the middle. And it said, an old Marine sniper lives here and you're in my field of fire. And, and 
I ask all the neighbors ahead of time, you know, like there's only six people, six families up there. But, and so when I sold my house to get off the hill, cause I couldn't do it anymore. Uh, the guy that bought it was from California, but he was an air force veteran. And he said, are you going to take your sign? I said, well, I, I will, but I have nowhere, you know, I live in a small town now. And he said, I want to keep it. That's, that's just, a conversation starter. <laughs> I love that. God, what a man. What a man. Yeah, guys, uh, they're saying this. Uh, it's Yeah, the pictures are great. Y'all know I'm a picture freak and love them. Uh, they're saying 40 Thieves are on my notes now. Yes, y'all. Oh, if yeah. y'all buy two books this month, this week, or whatever, get Mr. Ed's and, and get 40 thieves. You will not regret it. No, um, it, it, you know, it, it's funny because in our experience in Vietnam, we were 80% snipers and 20% scouts in Bill's experience in uh, 40 thieves. They were 80% scouts and 20% snipers because uh, they, I mean, they would sneak in bunkers and slit people's throats. <laughs> I mean, it's a hell of a book. <laughs> it, it, it's it's unbelievable. And I happen to reach out to one of, uh, he wasn't one of the 40 thieves, but his father was early amphibious recon and uh, and sniper trained. And, and he's uh, he knew some of the guys in the book and he, he shares stories and uh, they are, they are the real well, deal. When you think of Marines, they, these are the well, they, Marines like Justin Fuller that they, you. They were something. They they really were. It's uh and and yeah in my and uh, well everybody's opinion. I'm sure you you definitely uh kept the lineage alive and 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 uh and lived up to the expectations that I'm sure they expected of uh of of of, of following scout snipers. Life takers and heartbreakers. Absolutely okay. right, Casey. <laughs> um, That's a good one. Yeah, I, I I love that one. I've I've been known to throw that one out, and I'm glad glad Casey brought that one back up again. Um, we've had you for uh, two hours and fifteen now, and I don't want to give any more good stories away. Uh, did you have anything else that you would like to uh to to say or share with us before we close out for the afternoon? Well, I appreciate you having me on. I do want to mention that I uh, I did write a new book. Uh, it's called Death Rattle of the Republic. And it's about what happened to America. And uh, I, I tell you, it's not an easy read. It was a really difficult book to write. And I stumbled onto it because all I wanted to do in 20, I think it was about 2018, 2017, I just decided I wanted to research and see if you could timeline what happened to America, you know, judicial decisions, you know, just different things. So I started on that journey and I started a spreadsheet, you know, to just, as I read books, I'd put these events in it and everything. And one thing led to another and I, and it, I ended up with, uh, in four years, it took me four years and I read over 400 books and I ended up with over 2000 line spreadsheet. <laughs> and so I had to skinny that down. <laughs> and uh, so it became a uh, death rattle of the Republic, actually a Marine sniper. I, I put out on the web, does anybody, got a good name for this you know i was thinking of different things and uh a marine sniper down in florida current i mean he's in his 40s so he was over in iraq and afghanistan so he came up with uh, the title and uh, but it's about the communist subversion of america and uh, it, a lot of things you don't want to hear but are true uh the fifth column uh it's, it's yeah. a lot on the fifth oh, yeah. column works yeah it's just so if you have an interest anyway I'd, I'd throw that out but i appreciate being on it's always fun you know it's uh as a matter of fact i've just added that into the comments and the show notes for those of y'all that uh want to get it i've got it in my amazon but i have got to wait a little bit because i've spent a little too much money this much <laughs> on books so <laughs> i've got to take a, a little break for a second but uh 
as soon as I get my my money back up, I'll be getting that one as well. Um, we we've been honored to have you for uh, first of all our first uh, sniper scout sniper and having another marine on. We've been uh, SOG oriented because. I've, I've really been close with them the past four or five years, but growing up the, the son of a deceased combat Marine vet, I, uh, I've, I've always had a heartfelt spot from, for Marines. And, uh, I, I really got into force recon through Bruce Norton and, uh, Colonel Andy Finlinson and, uh, Rick Rabinold. And I inevitably learned more through Jack and, and found you. So, uh, I, I, I'm just want to thank you also for, uh, answering my friend request from a weirdo that just out of the blue friend requested <laughs> you on Facebook and asked to speak to you. So I, I greatly appreciate that. And if you uh, wouldn't mind, we'd, you know, we'd love to have you back on. Maybe we could uh, talk politics or talk current military one day. If you, if you'd be open to coming yeah. back home. Oh yeah. Yeah. I would. Excellent. Excellent. All righty. Well, uh, we've got a long list of thank yous, everyone. I'll pass these on to him. Uh, long, long list. It was a great episode, guys. But uh, we're going to shut it down. Uh, if you hang on a sec, I'll end the stream, Mr. Ed, and uh, we'll talk offline and end it. But, uh, guys, we're going to go ahead and cut it off uh, for the day, and uh, we'll be going live uh, on Wednesday. But, uh, Mr. Ed, we've had a great time with you, and we we'll, can't wait to have you back. Thanks. Yes, sir. All right. Let's see.